They're yours. Hit that one more time. I am the number one determinant of the success or failure. Here we go. Of my students. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to week 122 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy, hosted by Principal Kefele. Let's see who we got in here. I see Renee Graham in the building. That's a homie. That's right from Montclair, New Jersey in the building. We got my man Demetrius Scott. Facebook user is here. At some point, you're going to let us know who you are. We got my man Principal Carlos Baggage in the building. Rodney Richardson, Marsha Poe. My man Otis Kitchen, he's going to be up soon on the broadcast coming up soon. Principal Dot McKee Vegeta's in the building. Rhonda Russell Henderson, Takesha Hyde, Janine. I'm going to say your, your middle, your, your other name. Uh, Separano Wilkins is in the building. Dr. Sheikah Houston's in the building. Melissa Jones Shunu, uh, Chunu is in the building. Talima Chesney, Golfar WT. You got to let us know what that WT means at some point. Lysandra Brackens is in the building. Nyerka Coy Bush, my man, Sean Hurt. He just finished rocking at 10. And then Dr. Houston and Tammy Taylor just finished rocking at 1030. And then here we are. My man, Michael Benton's in the building. He's going to be on with us soon, too. James Wilburn's in the building. John Herricks, Louis Sanders, my homie from East Orange. Grace Castaneda. Let's see, let's see. Stacy Joseph, Marcus Morris, I see ya. Travis Marshall's in the building. My wife, the queen of the castle. Kimberly Broughton, Cafele in the building. Ohio girl Jones is in the building. Jennifer Harris, where we at, where we at, where we at? Ah, uh, Teresa Thacker, hit that share button. Hit that retweet button as you come in. We on LinkedIn now, too. Some of the LinkedIn folks, if you're with me, I got to build up a following on that one. But if you're with me, let me know and then hit that share button. LinkedIn has a share button on it. So hit that for me as well. We got our let Mello Johnson in the building. Cami Berry is in the building. Francis uh, Landers uh, Perez is in the building. Rashard Davis, my man out there in Vegas. Man, I got to get out there. I need, a va I need a vacation, man. I got one coming, though. But I need a vacation. I've been ripping. Uh, we got uh, Vanessa Deskin in the building. Dr. Roz Gaskins is checking in. Where we got, where here we go, here we go. Uh, Travis Marshall, Jasmine Harris, Adrian Young, Yolanda McKinney is in the building. Stacy Mabry's in the building. She's going to be with us, too. She was supposed to be on earlier, but we had to reschedule. She's going to be on. She's going to be bringing some serious flames. I know that, too. We got uh, Matthew Wallach, Charlene. Oh, man, I can't make the rest of that out. DVWSYT. We got my man O.C. Chapman in the building. Yo, let me talk about O.C. Chapman. I know I'm doing shout outs, but O.C. Chapman, also known as One Chapman, is doing big thing with the young kings down in Mississippi. Go to his page, O.C. Chapman. Just go to his page. See what he's doing with the young kings. I know I'm missing the word, oh, One. It's, it's young kings something something, right? O -C, but, it, but it's the young kings. It's an empowerment program where he's working with the young men. 
and he's doing it big. So go to his page. You know, we, you know, any, you know, anybody with an organization working with young people could always use a donation, right? So go to OC Chapman on Facebook, send him a friend request, and uh, keep up with his work. Not only his work in terms of young kings, but his work as a presenter. He's a speaker, right? He's a young man. He's he's a speaker. He's a presenter. He's a consultant, and um, and he's working on his doctorate. <laughs> That's a young man you want to follow. OC Chapman, my guy. We got um Cynthia Farmer in the building, Cammie Berry, Angela Carr, Monell, uh, Sam uh, Samantha Dane, Tara Pickett, um, 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 Professor Sherrod Lamont Laws is in the building. Alan Coart is in the building. I'm getting ready to get it started, y'all. I see what time it is. We got Arcella Austri in the building. Hey, y'all, hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. I know it's. I, I noticed over the over the years we've been doing this. And some people they like. All right, I'm gonna let him get through his announcements. I'm gonna pop up here like about eleven ten, right? Now you get with me at ten fifty five, man. So here we go, y'all. Look, it's that time. So let me let me say formally to everybody now. Good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 122 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And I don't know about you. I say it every week. But I think I know just by the fact that you tuned in this morning. But as I always start off, I want, I need you to know how I feel. Because see, that matters. Attitude matters. So to just let you know, to make it clear, I'm on fire. Yeah, man. Mm. That's how I feel, man. I've been in five states this week. Five states last week. Five states the week before. Five states next week, man. I don't know what the summer is. The summer is just going to Newark Airport, flying to the first destination, getting off, getting off the plane, getting the rental car, driving X number of miles, getting to the hotel, hope you get dinner in, go to sleep, and then speak all day, and then start the cycle over. That's it. I don't know no summer. I ain't had a summer in 11 years. I don't know what it is. But you know something? It don't matter because I chose to do this. See, it's not like someone said, this is what you have to do. I chose this work. So because I chose it, I made a decision. Hear me, somebody. I made a decision that I'm going to do it at a high level. See, some of us, we get into this, but we may not necessarily do it at a high level because we find that those challenges and those obstacles can be overwhelming. So they deflate us and then we start to bring it down a little bit. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Especially when that when that gate agent says your flight is delayed by several hours and meaning you're going to miss the connection. Oh, man, that's enough to stress you out because that means you're going to be driving all night. That means you may not get dinner. That means you may not be able to go to the hotel. That means, let me be graphic, you may not get to take a shower. You may not be changing your clothes. You're going to be wearing the same stuff the next day and you're going to be tired as heck. But guess what? I ain't worried about it. Here's why. Because I'm on fire. Woo! Woo! I had to get that out, man. I feel like better. I just took a Tylenol. I'm, I feel better now, right? I'm ready to rip. Let me, let, me, let me go through these announcements. First, my commentary for the week. Hit that share button, somebody. Hit that retweet. Let them know. I'm feeling St. Louis strong. I'm a lunatic this morning, and 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 I'm and I'm representing Bob Gibson, Hall of Famer. No, where we at? Number forty-five. Hey y'all, welcome to the first timers. Glad you're here, but don't let this be your last. Let this be your first. Then go to YouTube if you got nothing on the calendar today. Then watch all 121 of the preceding weeks now you can't do that in a day because most of them are 90 minutes long but watch them man it's a lot there dynamite guest inclusive of the one that's here today in the wings oh man watch all of them 
subscribe to the channel. Hit the red button. Subscribe to the channel so that you get all the updates as they come in. Next, um, we're on five platforms now. LinkedIn finally got on board, so I don't know if we got any LinkedIn people watching yet, but um, you got that option as well. LinkedIn, the two Twitter, the one Twitter page, the two Facebook pages, and the YouTube, and who knows, maybe I'll take it to Spotify and, and Apple Music and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> I'm still getting folks who are saying thank you as far as being hired to become an AP or a principal. So even at this late date, I'm getting them every day. So good job to those folks. And now here comes the heavy lifting. So do not feel because you got this position, you can graduate from the virtual AP Leadership Academy. Ain't no graduation from this. We, we ain't bestowing no degrees on nobody with this. This thing is just ongoing, ongoing. As long as I'm alive, it's ongoing. I'll be doing this thing through my 60s, which I'm, I'll be 62 in October. I'll be doing it through my 70s. I'll be doing it through my 80s. I may not have had that same fire, or at least be able to articulate the same way. I might be like, oh, I'm on fire. Fire, right? So however I got to bring it, but I'm going to be here, right? So make sure that you, you could be superintendent and this virtual AP Leadership Academy is still relevant. You could be commissioner of education and it's still relevant. So don't feel like just because I moved on, I don't need to watch that no more. Oh, come on, man. You kidding me? We keeping this thing relevant. Let's go. Another wave of schools is opening this week. Much success, success to you if there's somebody that's watching right now. Let's get it. Have the best year ever for this 2022-23 school year. Real quick, these are my most recent. The Equity and Social Justice Education 50. Hey, man, don't sleep on this. Get yourself a copy. This is my special one. The assistant principal 50, man, this is my baby right here, right? I'm working on volume two right now. I'll be finished by the end of September, right? Get yourself a copy, the aspiring principal 50. Get yourself a copy. And you know I got all the other ones down there, man. I ain't putting those up. We got too much to talk about. But they're there. Go to Amazon.com, put Ber Beruti Cafele in the search bar, and you'll see every book I've written, Right? And then lastly, I told you um, I'm rocking some car. I'm your major league baseball today, but I'm rocking me some some Bob Gibson man, Hall of Fame picture. That's what I'm rocking. All right, y'all. I got a guest today. Um, and 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 you know, I didn't say my commentary, and I'm not going to because I, I forgot it. I went right to other things because I want to bring my guest up, but I will say this. The title of it, just let me give you this. The title of my commentary is Equity is Not Your Enemy. Right. Let me say it again. Equity is not your enemy. I'm, I'm finding that life as a equity presenter is starting to present some new challenges that I didn't have to experience pre George Floyd's murder. Now, it's, it's it, people scared of this word, man. I mean, they telling me like, yo, <laughs> don't could you not use it? Could you not bring that up? We could have problems when you leave here. That That is in, listen to me, somebody, let me look at my camera on this one. That's insane to me. Especially when you think about what equity means, meeting the children where they are, as they are. Man, I feel like I'm all in the commentary now. Equity is not, I'm gonna just end it like this. Equity is not your enemy. Hey, somebody in one of them states, this going through this equity hysteria that we got to legislate it out. Mm -hmm. Hear me, somebody, because, you know, even though you might be scared of that word, doesn't mean you won't tune into me on a Saturday or watch the video later. Equity is not your enemy. Equity is not the enemy of your students. Equity is an ally. It's a friend. It's an answer it's a solution it's a key to the success of your students particularly those historically marginalized groups don't run from the answer run to the answer enough said enough said 
I got a guest today, y'all. I got the good doctor, Rashawn Smith, in the building. Let me bring him on up here. Man, hey, y'all, we got a superstar in the building. I'm not going to get to the bio yet, but we got a superstar in the building here when we talk about school leadership, and he's still young. So let me say to you, Doc, good morning to you. Glad to see good you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I appreciate you having me on. Before we jump into it, I just want to publicly get this out the way because um, literally I wouldn't be sitting in the seat as principal of the Grandview Middle School had it not been for you and two other people. And I want to make sure I give them public thank yous. Uh, the first one is my uh, prince, my superintendent, Dr. Kenny Rodriguez, principal or superintendent in Grandview C4 School District, who gave me the keys to the best car in the district at Grandview Middle School. Uh, my uh, boss who hired me at the time, Dr. Joanne King, who is now retired, but saw the potential in me as an assistant principal to uh, allow me to be the principal at Grandview Middle School. And to you, sir, because it was on a 12 hour drive from New Orleans back to Kansas City, bringing my daughter back from incoming freshman weekend at Xavier University, where I listened to the principals interview YouTube no less than eight times. And before I listened to that video, I had been on probably 10 interviews trying to get a principal's job and couldn't get a call back. And after listening to that video, oh, and I dissected it every single way. But the one thing I took away from it was when you walk out of that interview, you got to leave them with a story. And I remember the story I told, if you give me a couple moments real quick, you know, they ask you the question and say, uh, the question is, is there anything else you would like to add before you go or anything we didn't ask? And I said, you know, I just want to tell you all this. If you give me the privilege of being the principal at Grandview Middle School, we going to go on this journey. And I don't know about y'all, but I love road trips. And on road trips, it ain't about the destination, really. It's about the getting there. It's about those detours you take. It's about stopping at that little restaurant on the side of the road. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do some things that we ain't done before. We're going to make some missteps. We're going to make some wrong turns. But when we make those wrong turns, we're going to admit it, and we're going to find a route back to the highway to get to where we're trying to go. And my goal is that the trip is so fun and so good that when we make it to whatever that destination is, you'll be like, Dr. Smith, when are we going on our next road trip? When, what is the next destination we going on? And I walked up that interview, and I remember some of the uh, people telling me later on that uh, after my interview, they asked the, the board or the uh, superintendents that was in the room, do we even have to interview the rest of the people? Because we already know who we want our principal to be. So mm -hmm. it was because of you that I got this job. So I want to publicly thank you for all that you do for people like me to help us get in the door that was closed on us so many times. Man, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm honored by that. I really am. And, and, and the folks on here know, I talk about it every week, you know, that with the, when in terms of people who get the job and they, they watch the video and they they reach out to me and thank me. It means a lot to me. That's the fuel I need to keep going. But I also know it blesses me. So I, I appreciate you and, and, and appreciate you wanting to share that publicly with the folks. That's that's what this is all about. You know, whether it be the video, whether it be this particular platform, we're just trying to make people great, man, because 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 when people get great, then we increase the probability of children are going to be great. Right. And that's not to say that I'm great trying to make someone else great. It just mean I'm, I'm just that that servant that's trying to share some little information that I got in my head and in my heart and my spirit with other people. So I, I appreciate you. Hey, y'all, let's uh, let's see who who my guest is. And I, I just got this notification from LinkedIn. See, they they ain't got it all together yet. They said we we're struggling with streaming to LinkedIn. I was wondering why I didn't see any LinkedIn icons. So they still got to work out the glitches. But all the other platforms, we good. So, hey, 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 Doc, let me ask you, man, because, you know, like I, I, I've i been saying, pronouncing your first name as spelled, but I hear the, the Midwesterners calling you Vashon. So which, which is it, it Vashon or Vashon? It's Vashon. OK, so so <laughs> there we go. So Dr. Vashon Smith is the proud principal of Grandview Middle School in Grandview, Missouri, where the school's priorities are relationships, intentional planning and delivery, del intentional planning and delivery of instruction and advancing literacy and numeracy. Dr. Smith earned his doctorate of education leadership from St. Louis University in May of 2019, which is why I chose to rock this shirt today, by the way. Before being named Grandview Middle School principal, Dr. Smith served as an assistant principal, instructional coach, and math teacher in Kansas, Ohio, and Nebraska. Dr. Smith has a bachelor's degree in secondary math education, two masters from the University of Nebraska, and an education specialist degree from St. Louis University. 
Dr. Smith is an up and coming transformational leader, author, and presenter. Let me use that word again and presenter. So I'm sure if you sit, you listen to this interview and then send him that invite, he'd be ready to come out there probably on a Saturday. <laughs> his, <laughs> his, his work as a school leader is grounded in relationship building with a focus on instructional leadership, empowering student voices intentionally using the Marzano instructional strategies and creating a school culture where schools enroll families, not just students. Under Dr. Smith's leadership, Grandview Middle School was the March, was the March spotlight school in the Missouri PTA newsletter for its work in community and student engagement despite the pandemic. In addition, Dr. Smith is the co-host of the Engage podcast, which I'll have the flyer up tomorrow morning on my page. The Engage podcast, a co-author of Voices Volume 1 by Black Male Educators St. Louis, BM, BME St. Louis, and is the 2021-22 Greater Kansas City Middle School Principal of the Year. I want to say that part again. And is the 2021-22 Greater Kansas City Middle School Principal of the Year. Wow. That's a lot there. And you know something, Doc? Oh, I've read a lot of bios over the past year now because I've been doing, I did solos the first year and then this year it was all like interviews. And your bio was the easiest bio to create my agenda because it's it's just packed. Right. It's, 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 it's obviously you didn't give me the full bio because I know there's so much more to say about you. But but you gave me I was able to just draw so much content from this. So I, I, I love putting this whole agenda together. And like I told you off camera, I over planned. Right. <laughs> so so let's let's jump into it. Hey, folks, hit that share button. Hit that retweet. Let them know we are here. Um, Doc, I got three questions that I ask everybody. And because everybody's got a different spin on this as an educator. Who is Dr. Vashon Smith? Wow. Um, I, I would say first, and this, this means so much to me, I'm a black male educator, first and foremost. Woo! And I, I truly believe representation matters. Um, and I think a lot of my work is grounded in how important it is to have black certified males in the building working with our students. Um, after that, I am grounded in instructional leadership. I am a firm believer that the principal needs to be the head learner and the head instructional leader in that building. Um, it is hard to get people to follow you if you can't give them the path and show them the path to take. Um, so those are the two things I would say who I am, you know, first and foremost as a black male leader. And then after that, I'm an instructional leader um, grounded in making sure I show my staff and my community first how to do something and I give them the tools to get it done. You know, I, it, it, you're the first person I think that I've had on that actually identified themselves that way. And, and it resonated with me, which is why I probably without even thinking just said, "Woo!" because I would say 100 percent of my presentations somewhere within the presentation, I'll say to my audience, I'm not just a human being. I'm not just a man. I'm a black man. And, and I say, let me tell you why I share that with you because I have a black man reality. See, I can't suppress my, 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 my racial cultural identity for the sake of making others comfortable. Because even if I suppress it, my walk throughout the next 24 hours is going to remind me of what I am. So I'm going to therefore walk that walk proudly as what I am, right? It's, it's a huge part of my identity. So I was, as you, a black male principal, a black male teach, a black man principal, teacher, and just black man. And that's not offensive. It's just who we are, right? But sometimes we need to proclaim that. I love it. Hey, Doc, what, what, why'd you enter the field of education? And, and, and on top of that, what fuels your passion to continue to soar? Uh, I entered the field of education um, as a third major in college, it was not my first major. Um, I, I'm, as I talk to more and more black male educators, it's not our first choice when we go into college because we are steered away from education um, by so many people, probably not, in, not intentionally, but unintentionally, they steer us away from the field of education. But um, I was blessed to be a part of the um, 
in internship at the University of Nebraska Omaha called the uh, Minority Intern Program, where we got a chance to go into different organizations around the city. I got placed at the YMCA Teen Center and it started tutoring kids and actually, you know, was like, OK, may maybe education might be something I can look into. So then I got part of another program where I was able to go into the schools as a teacher assistant during my undergraduate years. Um, to earn a stipend and start the work. And I was actually at Omaha North High School uh, working with Tola Black, was my uh, mentor teacher at the time. And it was, it was good. I mean, I loved it, um, you know, working with kids. Math was, you know, my first love. And the reason why I actually went into math, I remember my advisor, Mr. Black in college, told me, like, uh, there, there's many things you can do, but I was going to be a PE teacher. I, I want to go be a PE teacher. I wanted to coach. I play, you know, sports and things like that. And he said, I'm not going to try to steer you away from doing that. But I'm telling you, if you go and become a math teacher, a science teacher, special education, you will always have a job. You will always have a job. And I always loved math. So that's kind of how I ended up in the math lane. But high school, I, it, it was cool, but I'm like, yeah, I don't know if this is really for me. So I went back to my supervisor, uh, Dr. Bonnie Perry, and was like, I, I don't know if this teaching thing is for me. I appreciate the opportunity of being in the schools, but uh, I feel like I probably need to go and do something else. And she was like, well, give me one more semester. I'm gonna put you out of middle school and just give, me, give middle school a try. And if you don't like it, I understand. And uh, I got placed at Monroe Middle School in Omaha, Nebraska. And literally the first day I walked in first period and I interacted with those students, I knew middle school was work. That was my lane. And mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer. Either, either you a middle school person or you not. Ain't no in between. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Ain't no in between when it comes to middle school. And I, I've been rocking middle school pretty much ever since then. In my 17 years, I did two years at the high school level doing other things. But I... I, I fully believe middle school is a found, those foundational year that really truly set kids up for success once they hit the high school level. So uh, being able to interact with young folks and mold minds and be an example for young black kids that I didn't have is definitely the reason why I went into education. Wow. You know, that, that middle school statement is, is really true. Um, when I'm in a, when I'm, when I'm presenting to a middle school audience, you know, you're in a middle school environment, even though they're not children there, because that's, those are, those are, those are special people. Mm -hmm. I was a middle school principal for eight years and I, I loved it. I, 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 I loved it tremendously until I got to the high school level. And it, it, it was a, it was just a different kind of joy in being with the older students, but the bulk of my years, eight years was at the middle school level, right? And, it, and and everybody can't do that level, whether it be in the classroom or as a teacher, it takes a special individual because because those are the kids in the middle <laughs> and they're trying to figure it out. You know, my last of the, my, my big three, I ask everybody, um, and it's interesting how there's so many different responses to this. I, I became a principal for one singular reason and it, it was all rooted in the young men, um, the young young men's empowerment. Others have multiple reasons as to why they wanted to lead after coming out of the classroom or, or, or counseling, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Was there anything in, 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 in your pursuit of leadership that kind of elevated itself above everything else that you said? I, I want to be a leader for various reasons, but this one thing, it really matters. Did you have one of those? For me, it was um, I, I was frustrated that I continually had administrators walk into my classroom and evaluate me and tell me what I was, what I wasn't doing right, but couldn't hold a candle to my teaching abilities. Who couldn't tell me, you know, you're doing X wrong, but couldn't give me the Y to get it right. Yeah. Um, and it just, it continued to frustrate me. So as I matriculated through my master's program um, at the University of Nebraska, and I remember every class we took, no matter if it was HR, or if it was finance or curriculum or whatever, every class the professor always started with, you are the instructional leader of that building. Hmm. And that's the thing that really continued to resonate with me is that when I became a principal, I wanted to be an instructional leader. I wanted to be able to walk into any classroom. I don't care if it's a sped classroom, a math classroom, a PE classroom, and talk to teachers. I may not know the content. I may not know world history. I may not know uh, earth science, but I know instruction. I know strategies that will get kids engaged, keep kids engaged, and move kids to higher levels. So if I could sit down with you and just say, hey, that, that content you got is on point. But how about we use this strategy to get them there? This is how you get kids' attention. This is how you hold kids' attention. This is how you redirect students. Like, to not just tell teachers, hey, you're doing something wrong, but here's how you get it right. Here's the next step. That you, or you might be doing an amazing job. You, you might be hitting, the, hitting out the park nine out of 10 times. But let me tweak this one thing. And now we're hitting 10 out of 10. Like, that's the thing that always pushed me to the forefront of, like, how do we help teachers get better? 
Not just tell them, hey, we want to raise reading scores. You know, that's, that's everybody's goal. Let's raise reading scores. But this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to raise reading scores. Here's how we're going to start a vocabulary development program. Here's how we're going to really get down to breaking down root words and helping kids understand context clues. Here's some reading strategies, SQ3R, that we're going to do in social studies class to help kids be able to read and review and be able to pull out. Give them actual tools that they can take back to the classroom tomorrow and put into practice, not just theory. And that was the thing that just really... When I walked out of the classroom and the blessing I had was I was able to be an instructional coach and learn what true instruction really looks like. And during that time, I got ingrained in the Marzano instructional strategy and just read the research and started to see it. And, you know, I've been to conference after conference. I don't read book after book, um, really just being able to know and be able to help teachers, but not just help teachers. How do I help those around me? How do I help my assistant principals? get that same mindset? How do I help my instructional coaches upgrade their thinking? How do I create teachers in the building that can take some of the reins and run with their colleagues and say, hey, won't you come to my classroom and watch this transition activity? So those are the things that I want. And the one thing I felt so strongly about it when I became a principal, I remember me and my assistant principal, Mr. Moore, who's still with me today, uh, we like brothers now. Like we, we finished each other's sentence. We done been together for so long as, you know, mm -hmm. principal, assistant, principal. And the funny thing is he was actually one of the finalists for this job. And, you know, when you up for a job and you don't get it, you kind of there's some bitterness there or whatever. And um, we sat down and you know met over the summer and I told him, I said, I want you to know, I don't need assistant principals that do discipline and help out with instruction. I want assistant principals who are instructional leaders who might do discipline every now and then. Your main focus should be instruction and being in the classroom. And that's what it guides my leadership. That is one of the founding things in my foundation as a leader is the instructional part of the building. Hey y'all, y'all y'all hear that? And, and 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 we ain't even in the body of the presentation of the interview yet. Y'all hear that? He said instructional leader. Now 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 let's let's look at one thing that that Doc just said that really resonated. He said he he not necessarily a master all them content areas that that he's that he's working with the teacher with that the teacher teaches. I'm I'm in where was I yesterday, man? I was in North Chicago, Illinois. And I said to a room full of teachers, when I walk into a classroom as instructional leader, I, if, if it's a physics teacher, I don't know physics. I'm glad I'm not a spell sp uh, physics. I don't know <laughs> physics. <laughs> Is it spelled with an F or PH? <laughs> right? I, I don't know no physics. I don't know chemistry. I don't know calculus and trigonometry. If you knew my past, you'll understand. Because some people say you should know because you don't know my background. <laughs> so, but here's what I do know. I know pedagogy, baby. I know pedagogy. So I will learn some of the physics is I'm, if I'm really paying it that kind of attention in the classroom. But that's not where I have to be a specialist. I got to know pedagogy. And that's what you just said, Doc. Hey, AP out there, you going in that classroom and you feel like you were at a disadvantage because you don't know the content area? You can't be an expert in all them content areas in your building, but you do have to be an expert in strategy. You do have to be an expert in pedagogy. And that's what Vashon is saying to you. Take notes. Get that down. I told him I was probably over ambitious in preparing this because I got a lot here, man. We in the intro. Let's get to the body. Hey, Doc, you the Kansas City, Greater Kansas City, Missouri Principal of the Year. That's that's big. I, I would think that a lot of us would like that kind of recognition because the translation is that students are performing. So my, my question to you, what are, what are the ingredients to being a leader at that caliber? Uh, I, I think the first ingredient is don't care about the award. Don't care about the recognition. That's the first ingredient. Uh, when, when I won that award, I, there's very few times in my life, and if my grandmother was tell you, she would tell you that I was ever speechless. I always had something to say. Even when I was in school, I had to have the last word with the teacher. That's why I stayed in trouble. Uh, but when I won that award, I was speechless because that's not what I do it for. And it really... The award has my name on it, but that it's missing about 70 other names because I got some teachers and some custodians and some secretaries who names should be on that award right next to mine because they are the people that are making it happen. I'm the person with the vision, but they are the ones executing that vision. So um, that's the first ingredient for me is to just make sure you ain't doing it for the recognition. You, you about 
what are you doing that's going to be better for students today than what they had yesterday? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I've, I've thought about over the last this summer, and people have asked me that question, like, what are you doing? And all that. I think the one thing that I want to do, not just for my students, but for my staff, for my parents, my students, I want to create experiences. Like, I just don't want kids to come in my building and, and get reading, math, PE. I want them to have experiences because if, if anybody knows anything, you remember experiences. You remember the first time you rode a plane. You probably remember your first day of high school. You remember your first job. You remember those experiences that you had. And that's the thing that we want to do at GMS every single day is how can we create an experience that's memorable for students? How can we create an experience that is memorable for parents? How can we as a leadership team create experiences that are memorable for our teachers so that they can duplicate that experience for our kids in the classroom? Yeah. So that's the, the thing that I look at is what are the experiences that we are creating on a daily basis for the people that we are in contact with, no matter if it's the student, the staff, the outside community, parents. Um, and then beyond that is, what is it that students need? A lot of times we assume as adults, we know what kids need, but how many of us has really sat down and asked a student, what is it that you need? Yeah. Sat down and said, you know, Tyree, Tyree, I don't see you getting kicked out of class the last three days. What is it that you need in order to stay in that class? What is stopping you from function at the next level of your achievement level? How many of us really sit down? And uh, Dr. Harris, who's on one of the people in the comments, one of my principals, she's the principal at Martin City K-8 in our district. She said something the other day in our uh, administrators, PD, PD says, we are great with being present and in the moment with kids. But as adults, we are horrible at being present and in the moment with other adults. As a school leader, we sit down with teachers and talk to them about things. And we own our computer while we're talking. Are we looking at our phone? We're talking. Are we walking down the hallway trying to have a conversation? We don't ever stop and give that teacher our undivided attention and say, what is it that I can help you with? Because just because it's not my emergency doesn't mean it's not their emergency. And sometimes we have to set our emergency aside to address their concern so that they can then go back in the classroom and take care of the kids that we you know, empower them to take care of. Um, so those are the things I would say are the ingredients. But the main ingredient for me is I, I don't look for no recognition. I don't care if it ever comes again or doesn't come. I know what I'm doing on a daily basis. The recognition I want is when, my, when I'm at eighth grade celebration and parents come to me and say, Dr. Smith, the last three years of my kids' school experience has been the greatest three years of their lives. That's the recognition I want. Wow. Wow. You know, that word experience, I, I know there are teachers on this call as well. You got some teachers on here and I know there are teachers here who don't even aspire to become administrators. Just 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 tune in. And I want to ask the rhetorical question, teacher. What is the experience of being a student in your classroom? That big picture macro, what is the experience? Hey, leader watching AP principal, superintendent, whomever's on here. What is the experience of being under your leadership? When I go to a restaurant, the, vibe, the level of the tip is not the food. It's the experience. What kind of magic waiter, what kind of magic waitress, server, will you create that wasn't just the food was tasty, but just the experience of that hour of being in that space that you created what was that? And that's going to determine what kind of tip I get. The experience, not the food. You know, Doc, another, you didn't mention this because I mean, because I know you could go all day with these ingredients, but here's one I know that, I, that, I, that I'm assuming I, I, I feel very confident that is another ingredient. And that would be your attitude, right? Just the attitude that you bring to the work, the attitude you bring toward your leadership, towards your students, towards your staff, toward your school, just th that overall attitude. And I wanna ask the question, a two-parter, with the myriad of challenges that, that a leader, and I wanna go back to the leader and I wanna particularly go to the assistant principal, but with the, 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 the just the myriad of, a cha of challenges that, that accompany leadership, and particularly with this, this, this new age that we're in with this pandemic, how does one sustain an attitude of positivity while simultaneously keeping the main thing, the main thing, student learning? Wow. That's, that's a good one. Um, for me, I think the, the, the positivity goes back to your why. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why is it that you went into education? 
Why is it that you stayed in education in this time? Why is it that you stepped out of the classroom and wanted to become a leader of education? Um, those are things that I think are going to keep your positivity intact as you struggle with whatever the situation we're in. An irate parent, you know, the pandemic that we dealt with for two years, going virtual and all that stuff. That. And then how do you make the best of every situation? And knowing that you're going to get some things wrong, you're not going to be 100 percent right. Yeah. And I think the one thing that I have learned, um, I think I understood it as an AP, but I have learned it in this role as principal, is you can't make 100% of the people happy 100% of the time. Right. There's some people that you're going to piss off. Do me a favor, repeat that, please. You cannot make 100% of the people happy 100% of the time. But at the end of the day, when you go home and you lay your head down at night, can you say the decision I made was in the best interest of students? The decision that I made was in the best. And it might not be for 100% of your students, but the decision I made was for the betterment of my students. And as long as you are making decisions like that and keeping students at the forefront of your thinking, that's going to be what you need to rely on. Your why, am I putting students first? And the thing that I, I want to make sure I, I leave people with is students' needs should supersede adult wants. And I remember I had a big battle after my first year and I changed the master schedule. And people, teachers were upset. And I remember I had a staff meeting, I had to tell them, my priority are student needs, not adult wants. Right. Yeah, you may want to have that class at that time, but I need you to have it over here so that more students can take it. Or you may want to have your plan period right here, but I need you to have your class right there because I have students that's gonna overlap over there. How do we continue to put students first? Because I think so many times in education, I don't care from the federal level down to the local level. We forget what we are here for. We forget who we serve. Who is our main constituent? Students. Yeah. We are too busy trying to make adults happy. We make a decision based on adult experiences and not thinking about students at the end of the day. So as an AP, whatever your situation is, go back to your why. And if that's an affirmation you need to put up in your office, on your mirror in the morning, and then like I said, when you go home at night, can you say, you know what? The decision I made today, I, yeah, I didn't make everybody happy. Half my staff is mad. That parent was upset, but I know I made that decision that was in the best interest of that student. That's all, that's all I care about. And as long as I'm doing what's best for students, everybody else can kick rocks with open toe sandals on. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Wow. You know, I had, um, Sean, I had a, um, someone wrote me on, on Messenger yesterday. They may even be on the call. I told them, make sure you're here. And they said to me, I'm a new AP. And sometimes I heard you say that in some of those AP positions, that person may be relegated to the person that does all the dirty work. And this is the first, this is obviously we're in the beginning of the year. And this person said, wow, I, that's exactly what I do. And the person said, wow. Right. And, you know, I responded. But I want you to speak to because he's not the only one. It's a lot of them out there. Speak to that AP that was so excited about this new position of leadership, being number two in the building. And now they're, 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 not, they're doing nothing that relates to what they used to do when they were in the classroom, right? Now it's, 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 it's all this quote unquote dirty work. It's, you know, it's discipline. It's, you know, all that kind of stuff. Talk to that person who's probably on this call, not that separate individual, but folks on this call who are in that position and feel frustrated already, what would you say to them about, and, and I know you said that why, but I want to just give it this context. What would you say to them about stay focused because this is not your long-term goal? What, 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 what would you say to build on that? So, so part of it is um, I, I think the system's not in place for you to do those things that you want to do. And it's, it's not your building. Um, you're there. I fully believe when I was assistant principal in my interview, when they asked me, what do I think the role of an assistant principal is? I told him my role as assistant principal is to make my principal look good. That's my role. Whatever that he needs me to do is to make him look good. I ain't, I'm not the captain of this ship. I'm, I'm second in command. So right. the system may not be in place. So first thing is you have to say, what do you want that system to look like? And how can you and your role make that happen? And I like it to say you're going to have a dinner party but your kitchen a hot mess. You got dishes everywhere. You ain't took out the trash in a while. It, it's a mess. But you know, you got this dinner party coming up that you got to get ready for. So, well, what you need to do then is you, you got to start somewhere. 
Okay, we well, you know what? I'm gonna take the trash out first. Let me get the trash taken care of. All right, I got the trash taken care of. Let me go ahead and clean these dishes up, get these dishes clean. Okay, I got that done. Let me go ahead and mop the floor. You gotta start somewhere. So what I did, I'm gonna give you what, what I did. And this, and this may not work for everybody, but I'm gonna give you practically what I did. Mm -hmm. So when I became an assistant principal, I went into a building that had a brand new principal too. So mm -hmm. I was a new AP, he was a new principal, and we were taking over a school that had some issues. And he, some major discipline issues. So basically we had to, you know, I had to handle all that discipline issue. But what I did was I had a team. I had a, a secretary. I had an a ISS teacher. And I would tell my secretary, hey, I'm going to go down to the math classroom for, for one period. If a kid comes for me, just have them sit in ISS until I get back. Because whatever they did, they ain't going away. I'm, so had them sit in ISS so I can get into this classroom. And I, you know, I would go into the classroom and I would talk with, you know, do the observation or I would go sit in a PLC meeting and I would just observe, just, just observe. And then eventually teachers would come and say, hey, you were in, our, in my room, you know, tell me what you thought. And I would just give a little nugget of, you know, a little bit of nugget. Or they would use, hey, in PLC, hey, we're looking at this data. Well, how do you think we could attack this? And I would just offer a little bit of nugget. And I would still get my discipline handled because I, after I got done with that POC in that classroom, I would go to ISS, get the kid I needed, handle that situation and go on about my day. But eventually those teachers would go to the principal and be like, hey, Mr. Smith, well, I was Mr. Smith back then. Mr. Smith was in my room earlier today and he saw this and he told me to try this and I tried it and it worked with this kid. Or, hey, we was looking at this data. He told us, showed us this assessment tool that we can get data a little quicker and it worked. And eventually they were the one that sold to the principal what I was bringing to the table instructional. So then he would come to me and be like, hey, you know, at the next faculty meeting, can you do a PD over that, what you showed them in the math department? Or can you do a PD over what you showed them over in the social department? So I slowly had to clean up the trash over here. I had slowly mm -hmm. had to do this over here. I had to earn my credibility in bits and pieces. And it wasn't until probably year three that he saw my value as instructional leader. He was like, you know what? I think we need a dean of discipline to handle discipline so I can free you up more to get into classrooms because I see the teachers you're working with, their numbers are going through the, going up. Mm. So it's not going to happen overnight. And you have to change the, the mental map of some principals who don't understand your, your, your role and your importance, but you have to do it in incremental steps. But what you have to do is you have to figure out what is the ultimate goal that I have and then how do I systematically and strategically build my way to getting to that end goal that I have? But you just, but don't get frustrated because it's not, trust me, it's not going to happen overnight. Me and my principal, had, it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows. We had some, some back and forths. He had some time where you spend too much time in the classroom. So there were some times where I had to pull back because once again, it's his building. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I have to do what he's asking me to do. But eventually, like I said, it probably took two, two and a half years to get where I needed to be. When I walked, but when I walked out of that school as the assistant principal, when I left to go be principal, we had two deans of students in place. Now to free up that AP to get into classrooms and be more involved in instruction. So sometimes the work you're doing is not for you. It's for the person coming behind you. I love it. And you know, with your, your perspective on the relationship between the principal and the AP is my perspective. I've had some heated social media debates with people about that who feel that the AP is, um, is at the level of the principal just has this title of AP. And I'm like, stop it. Your superintendent is not holding that AP accountable for anything. <laughs> they, they, if the AP screws up, they ain't calling the AP. They're calling the principal, right? But I've, I've over the years, I mean, I've gotten in some heated stuff with folks around that. It's, the principal is the leader of the building, and that assistant is there to assist that principal, period. Right. You, 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 you provide the AP with the, with the flexibility to grow, fine. You say so you, you're exposing that AP to the various facets of leadership. Fine. But at the end of the day, it doesn't say principal and co-principal. It says principal and it's only one in the building. Right. So I, I, I love what you say. <laughs> hey, 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 Doc, you know, the movie Rocky, the movies. I don't know if you've seen them all, but I, I have. But Rocky three is my movie and, and i don't mean just in the rocky series i mean in like my top five movies probably in life and and i i just want to give you this because i don't expect you to have all them rockies memorized unless you a rocky a rocky fan or fanatic like me but rocky three is the one where rocky lost his eye of the tiger right he he was the heavyweight champion of the world but he lost his eye 
and he and he stopped training hard. He stopped taking it seriously and got it got got beat down, right? By Clubber Lang, played by Mr. T. My question to you: You won the heavyweight championship of the world, so to speak, in education. That's a big that's a big honor. And other people on this on this call are 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 going to achieve at those on those levels as well. Meaning that the students, they're with you. The staff is with you. We rocking together. How do you? And I'm asking you this question not so much relative to you, but I'm asking it relative to folks in the audience. How do you keep your eye of the tiger after attaining success at various different levels? How do you stay hungry? Is the question I'm asking. Uh, the, you have to realize the job ain't done. Like I said, my, my kids, when we look at our data or you look at your students' data, unless you got 100% of your kids reading on grade level, 100% of your kids doing math on grade level, yeah. the, the job ain't done. You could be sitting at 98%. I'm going to ask you, where the other 2% at? There you go. And you can say, you know what? We rocked it out last year, but you know what? I got a whole new set of sixth graders coming in this year. The job is never done. This is a this is a unfinished work that we do in education. And yeah, you may have won that award. You may have you know took your kids to high achievement levels last year, but you know that's the saying in the world. What have you done for me lately? You know, just because you had that you know behavior plan that worked for student A, that behavior plan probably gonna work for student B. You have to constantly be saying, how do I get to the next thing? How am I reaching that next kid? You know, I want to be to the point where it's Dr. Smith educated billions and billions of billions, not just because they came through my school, but I educated. I changed the lives of every single student that came into my building. And until you've done that, you haven't made it. You haven't done nothing. You know, don't 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 rest on your laurels. Don't, you know, be excited about the, the awards. Be excited about like don't, I'm not saying that you don't celebrate those things. But you got to you got to turn the page at some point and say, OK, on to the next one. There you go. On to the next one. You know what I'm saying? There was a uh, a commercial. I remember growing up uh, that sticks out of my head where uh, Emma Smith, I think it was a Gatorade commercial. might have been. But I remember it was right after the Dallas Cowboys won their first Super Bowl. And Emma Smith's in the weight room pumping iron. He's on the bench press. And, you know, the little noise is playing in the background. Emma Smith, you got the Russian title. Emma Smith, you won the Super Bowl. You got this. You got this. Don't you think you should take a rest? And he holds the barbell for like three seconds and said, that's enough rest. On to the next one. There you go. Because there's always going to be a next one. Yeah, you, you need to rest and celebrate, but there's always a new challenge. And if you don't have a new challenge, go ahead and put your retirement paperwork and walk away because you're doing kids a disservice at that point. Yeah, I, I'm with you. So so therefore, because 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 I'm, I'm always thinking about the audience, always because of what this platform was created for. So that one that's listening to you, that one that listens to me, that one that listens to our guests, and they're always hearing this theme of going hard, going hard. In fact, show your shirt and explain that shirt to me real quick. So do we go hard from 810 to 310. This is our school hours. 810 is our first bell. 310 is dismissal. And I tell my teachers, I don't care what you do before you get here. I don't care what you do out here. But when you here with kids from 810 to 310, I need everything you got. I need you to go hard for all those minutes when you got kids sitting in front of you. <laughs> Love it. So, so with that said, then that one is this hearing you and say, yeah, I'm going to go hard. How does that person maintain a, a, a healthy balance between work life and life outside of work? So just like I said, I mean, at 310, when that dismissal bell rings yeah. and your contract is time up, don't take work home with you. I, I don't, you know, and. I'm probably gonna get some people, you know, roll out of me, but I don't. I don't care. You can check the stats. You know what I'm saying? My work speaks for itself. There are probably three days a week I don't take my laptop home with me because I need time for me. Because if, mm. you know the, the the saying that says you can't pour from an empty pitcher. Mm. You can't keep going and going and going and never recover yourself. So you need to say when the day is over, leave that 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 stack of paper is gonna be there tomorrow. Go home and have your glass of wine. I would tell you now, my love language is happy hour. That's one of my love languages. <laughs> so uh, so you got to take care of you. And you should have an administration that understands the importance of you taking care of you and not trying to burn you out. So you definitely got to make sure that you put yourself first, because if you burn yourself out, trust me, you're doing them kid, you, you burning kids out at that point. Man, that's some powerful stuff. I'm going to keep going because I, I said I overplanned, but I want to I want to get all this in here. 
you know, there's as as you know, and anybody in leadership on here who's seasoned, everything is not success story. There's some mishaps, could be many. There could be some missteps, right? So, 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 so some setbacks, mishaps, missteps could be a part of the journey. They probably are a part of the journey. They may even be an inherent part of the journey, but we learn from it. So I want to ask you a two-parter. First, you, and then we'll talk about the audience. How, how do you, Dr. Vashon Smith, how do, how do you handle those setbacks and missteps emotionally? Uh, wow. How do I handle the missteps emotionally? You, you got to have that inner circle. You, you got to have that inner circle that you can trust, that you can go to and say, hey, I'm dealing with this. Or, hey, I'm struggling with this. Or, hey, this happened. Help me get through it. I, I don't need you. And sometimes you need to say, you know what? I don't, I don't need your opinion. I don't need you to tell me how, how I should have handled it. All I need you to do is just listen. Let me vent for a minute. Because by me talking through it, I can problem solve it myself. But sometimes you need to just be able just to get it off your chest. Um, and some of them you're going to carry for a while. Like, you know, there was a, a, a situation, and I'm, I'm going to bring this back to students because I said I try to bring back the students. But at the um, end of last school year, we did an activity in our admin retreat for the district. We had to write this poem about who we were. And it talked a lot about like our childhood, where you from, what represents you as a kid, places you went. And um, one of my colleagues who was sitting next to me was having a very emotional time with it like struggling with it. And, you know, I'm trying to, you know, talk to her and, you know, talk her through it. And she said that there were some things that I thought I had healed from that I see I have not. Mm. And there was a couple other people in the room that had that. And after we done with the activity, we reflected on, they said, you know, what's some reflections that people have? And the one thing that I, I stated, and I, I truly believe this is that we were asked to write a poem about our childhood. And some of us, our childhoods was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we couldn't get through this activity. 20, 30 years in the, from, uh, later, but yet we asked our students, whatever happened to you last night, I need you to leave it at the door. Mm. So how do you expect a kid to drop the fact that their mama got arrested last night or their brother got shot last night or they didn't eat breakfast this morning at the door when you couldn't deal with your daddy being a drunk 30 years ago and you still struggling with that? So some things we gonna, you going to carry with you, but you have to learn how, because I lost my brother back in 2011, was murdered. And I oh. tell people, people, t people say time heals all, all won't. No, time doesn't. We learn to live with it, but that hole always going to be there. That gate, But I learned to say, okay, last year I cried about this on his birthday the whole day. This year I only cried half a day. I'm making progress. And that's what life is. Life is about how are we making progress? So when you make those mistakes and they're going to they hit you emotionally, I can tell you quite a few I made. That I still to this day sit back and reflect on. But what I do is I use it so I don't make that mistake again. Or when I go into a similar situation, I say, you know what? The last time I acted emotionally, this time I need to make sure I got my emotions in check. This time, instead of when I sit, feel my emotions coming up, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? Emotions are starting getting involved. I think we should take a break and maybe come back and visit this later. So that's the thing. Like, How do you take those mistakes, even though they're still with you, but we use them as a stepping stone and not a stumbling block? Wow. Stepping stone, not a stumbling block. You know, you said something powerful just now. And, and, and you know, condolences to, to, to you and your family relative to your brother. You said something. Um, we'll tell young people to, to, to check those emotions at the door. But we still grappling with stuff 30 years, 40 years, 50 years ago. And it's still with us emotionally. And, I, I, you know, I think that just was worth repeating because sometimes we do think, you know, we talk about SEL and managing one's emotions, having control over one's emotions. But but the bottom line is there are things that are going to impact us probably for the rest of our lives. And sometimes we just need to remind one another of those realities. I don't need to ask you that second part of because you you went right into it. Right. So, you know, there's there's a there's a blog post you wrote that I, I actually I absolutely love. Um, I want to, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about it now. I want you to talk about it, but I'm also going to make sure that I say that folks read this blog post. But, but given the immeasurable impact of the pandemic, we'll never, we'll never know the the the, the exact damage that has been done. It's 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 immeasurable. But according to a blog post you wrote entitled "Here's What I Did When Students' Stress and Conflict Rose." You saw an uptick in, in an uptick in behavioral conflicts, and you stated, and I want to quote you here: 
we take every opportunity to bring together student voice, student relationships, and school-wide SEL, social emotional learning. And just as importantly, we take every opportunity to show students we're doing all this to support them. As a result, we've seen behavioral incidents decrease dramatically. That's at the end of the article. It's a powerful article. At one point, I thought I was going to do the whole interview just on the article because you had so much meat in there. But then I said, well, let me let me do it this way. So what I want to ask you to do, those three ingredients, student voice, student relationship, and school-wide SEL, expound on that for us. And why are those three such cornerstones to the work that you do as leader of your school? Okay. Before I give it to you, I want to give you, you one data point because I think we, we talk a lot um, and we, we don't really go back to, is this measurable? You know, he's saying he's doing all this stuff, but how does the numbers back it up? I'm going to give you one set of numbers. The year before I became principal at Grandview Middle School, they had 1,300 office referrals for the year. Hmm. 1,300 and a school population of 600. Wow. That's a little, that's an average of over about two point something for every student. Coming back after a year of virtual learning with last year, and it, I, you know, I've read a lot of stuff across the country, people, there was an uptick in referrals, discipline, things like that. We finished the school year last year with 714 office referrals. Now, that's still a lot, but that's a 40% decrease after the pandemic. Yeah. So obviously there's something that we doing that's working. Yeah. So to ask your question, uh, social emotional learning, Student voice, like what was the third one you gave me? Student relationships. Student relationship. So I'm gonna start with the relationship piece because like I said, when you read in the bio, we have three priorities and our very first priority is relationships. Relationships. And once again, like I said, I am the lead learner in this building. So if I'm not displaying the proper relationships with students, with staff, with parents, I can't expect my, stu my staff to. So relationships is something that we drill home to the point where the first week of school, teachers are not allowed to teach any new content. That first week of school, you, your primary thing is relationships, routines, procedures, expectations. How do we get that rapport built with kids, making sure they understand we are here for them, making sure that I, I just want every kid to have a relationship with at least one adult in the building. Because I believe we can use relationships to build other relationships. So you may not have a good relationship with that kid, but if your team teacher do, how can that team teacher be the inroad for you to get a better relationship with that student? So that's the first piece is can we get a relationship with every one of our kids with one, any adult it don't have to be it could be the custodian it could be miss winnie the cafeteria manager it could be miss dyer my attendance secretary it could be miss johnson my librarian i don't care who it is i need every student to have one positive relationship at least with one adult yeah. so that's the first piece that they that way if the kid is going through something they're dealing with something they know they have somebody in the building they can go and talk to and maybe not even talk they just need to sit in their presence and be able to decompress for a moment so that's the first thing is just really building those relationships with our kids. And that thing is student voice. Like I said, our students are, that's our, our number one constituent group. We provide a service and they are a customer. So how, if we, if that's like you said earlier, you went to a restaurant and your tip depends on the service that you got. Mm -hmm. If you don't get a good service, you ain't going to give a good tip. If we go to, go to a place and we don't get a good service, we going on Yelp, we going on Google, we going somewhere to write a bad review. Companies send out sur uh, customer surveys all the time. But how often do we survey our customer? Yeah. How often do we sit down with our customer and say, how are we doing? Yeah. Hey, we, we started this new curriculum, this new resource. How is it with you? Does it feel it meets your needs? Hey, we, we're one-to-one -one MacBooks. Do you feel like we're on the computers too much? Do you think we need more paper pencil work? Like those are questions that we ask our student in our student surveys. Like, hey, we last year we wrote our academic team. So we've been using academic team across the building. Does you feel like it's having an impact on your learning? So how are we surveying getting students voice? We started this new reconnection conference uh, last, we, fourth quarter of last year, where when students are suspended, traditionally they will get three days. Now we give them two days with one day in school suspension. And on that last day, they come back in school suspension and we do a reconnection, reconnect them to the building. So those kids that went through it, how, how do you feel that helped you when you got back to the building? Do you feel like that helped you reconnecting, getting in back classroom as opposed to going back to class cold turkey? So the things that we're doing, are we actually talking to kids and get it? The article talks about because last year in the beginning of the school year, we had an uptick with kids, just aggressive behavior towards students, towards staff. 
So my thing is, suspension don't change behavior. It don't. It, I tell teachers all the time, I can put a kid out for 20 days. On that 21st day, they come back to your classroom. What's going to be different? Hmm. Suspension don't change kids. And we was like, what are we going to do to address this? So I went to my student council. I went to a student council meeting and said, hey, look, we are having issues with bullying, kids being aggressive towards teachers. These are y'all classmates. Y'all experience some of the same things they're experiencing. What can we do as adults to help y'all in this process? What do you need for us to bring this back down to help you readjust to the school environment? Because obviously as adults, we ain't figured it out because the numbers are still going up. And it was in those conversations where we talked about SEL. So we went out and we have been using it um, in our in our in-school suspension program. Uh, second step is the curriculum, or the resource that we use. We ended up doing it school-wide. So every Monday in their Bulldog class, kids got an SEL lesson around peer pressure, around bullying, around self-esteem, self-identification. Every Monday they were getting those lessons. And those lessons were... Here's a thought provoking question. Give kids two minutes to write about it. There was some role playing that was involved in it. And that worked, I would say, probably for the good majority of our kids. But then it was those kids who needed some extra support. So then how do we bring in Miss Williams, our ISS teacher, and give them some of those behavior replacements? Do we need to, you know, put the, the instruction on pause, the curriculum on pause for some of our students and get them some replacement behavior things and to focus on that? Because the kid ain't learning anyway if they're getting kicked out of class. So how do we work with them around their behavior and school expectations to get them so they can't stay in the classroom? And then on the flip side, I went back to my teachers and told them, remember, we're about progress, not perfection. So if Timmy was getting kicked out of your class into a buddy room five days a week, and three weeks later, he's only getting sent out two days, let's celebrate those three days he's now in class instead of focusing on those two days he's not. Mm -hmm. How are we giving kids praise for what they're doing? And I have people that say, well, we don't praise you know, expected behaviors. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to. And sometimes you got to give extrinsic rewards. Now, I'm not saying the kids should always be on the extrinsic reward because eventually we want to become intrinsic. But what are we doing as adults to say, hey, students, obviously there's a disconnect. We can't figure it out. So we need you to help us in that process. Yeah, I got a doctorate, but look, I ain't dealing with what you're dealing with. I don't live in the time of self, you know, immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up on an iPad. So, and the funny thing that we were shocked about, our kids told us, hey, we are doing too much screen time in class. We do wish we could do more paper, pencil work. Oh. So we made that adjustment. But mm -hmm. as adults, we assuming we spent all this money on these MacBooks. Yeah, you're going to use them. But once again, a MacBook is just a tool. Yeah. And if you ain't using the tool right, it don't make a difference. If you're using a chainsaw to try to nail in a, uh, to nail in a nail, you, you're wasting your time. Right, there you go. I love that. I love that analogy, too. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, Doc, we're, we're, we're in a new normal. Um, and that's not to imply that the old normal was a good normal, but we're, we're in this new normal. And I'm thinking about with this question, you know, the, the launch of a new school year is, is always a big deal because it's the foundation to the rest of the school year. So my, my, my question to you is with the impact of a pandemic going into this next school year where we're, where it's still here, does it have implications for how we should launch a school year like does anything change or or do we do it the way we we, we normally would do it despite the fact that we're in a pandemic uh so i, I guess that depends on what you was doing beforehand yeah. if 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 you started the school year you're launching the school year if the first day of school in your building looked the same as the 12th or the 30th or the 112th day of school you got a problem because that first day of school is an experience for kids kids have been gone for the summer They've been away from your building from anywhere from two to three months. That needs to be an experience. And I give all kudos to our uh, central office staff, our superintendent, the cabinet, our PR person. Uh, we had Welcome Back Bulldog Day. Uh, this was the first year we rebranded our district. Everybody, all the schools in our district are now in Bulldogs. So we have a new mascot that we branded. So we, we had a big old Welcome Back Bulldog party. Like, you know, we talked beforehand, you know, at our school, we had the mayor, of the city there. We had the sisters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated there. We had our community partners and serve pro there. Uh, we had some of the central office people there. We had music playing. You know, we had high five and we had pop up. We made it an experience. Like we are so excited to have you back in the building. We are so geeked to have you back in the building. We want to be out here to celebrate you, the student, our number one customer on coming back into our building and showing you what it's going to be like, not just on day one, but we're going to create experiences all throughout the school year. So I think you have to come with a level of excitement and then understand also that there are some kids 
who may have been virtual in the year when virtual was the thing. They even last year, you know, they might have had the virtual option. So there's some anxiety about them being back in the building with their peers. So what are you doing to wrap around supports with that kid to help them adjust back into the building? You know, so, but if, like I said, if your day one looks the same as day 101 or day 25, there's a problem because you should be figuring out how do we make this an experience for kids and how do we get kids? There was a, uh, a book um, that we'll talk about later, so I'm not gonna give it away. But in that book, they say your first day of school should still be so excited that kids are breaking down the door to get in the next day. That's right. That's right. And, and But imagine that first day, the day is comprised from the principal's message all the way to the last period teacher. Oh, the, the day is comprised of the review of the rules of the school in the classroom accompanied by the consequences. My question rhetorically would be, what could be so exciting about that experience? Right. So I could understand a school that's really troubled, that's really trying to get itself right. And there's a need to mention rules. But there are other, there are other schools where we can keep it upbeat and very positive and we can get to rules if we have rules at a later time. I want that first day, that launch day, that launch pad to be so overwhelmingly positive that young people are excited about coming back tomorrow as opposed to, man, they beat us down today. Wonder what tomorrow's going to bring, right? So, so, so consistent with everything you said. What do you, can, what do you, can I jump in? I yeah, add yeah, on to yeah, that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because that that whole first day being about rules and things like that, just it, it kind of rubbed me. One of our we don't we don't even use the word rules in my building because I feel like rules are made to be broken. Uh, but the thing that what's the most important thing to a kid? Their name. That name is really that kid. So if you sit in your room the entire 53 minutes of our class period going over your rules, talking about your syllabus, and you never earned the most important thing about a kid, their name, you think that kid want to be back in your class tomorrow? They don't give a damn about your rule, your yeah. syllabus, how many quizzes we going to have. You don't even know me as a person yet. So how about you build a relationship with me, and then we can talk about how you want me to function in your room and how you want me to do things. But if you ain't got that relationship in place first, you don't wasted my 53 minutes sitting with you. Yeah. I'm just I'm just somebody in the classroom, a number. I'm not a right. I'm not a human being. I'm not a person. I'm not somebody that you could develop compassion for because I'm just somebody that you expect me to comply with the rules. Good stuff. So so consistent with that, thinking about this new normal that we're in, in 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 what ways might leadership and I, and of course I don't want you to write the whole book, just an example that leadership may have to shift as a result of the new normal that we're in? Um, grace with accountability. You And I, I feel like that's across the board. You have to give grace to your teachers, but still hold them accountable. But if that teacher ain't got their lesson plan in on Friday because they had a rough Friday or Thursday, hey, I understand. Get them to me by Sunday. Yeah. You know, you got to have grace with your parents because parents are frustrated. They dealing with the inflation. People don't lost people because of the pandemic. You know, the one thing that I, I constantly, as I go out and talk with, you know, been able to have a few speaking engagements I've had over the last year um, is tell people that we are dealing with a generation of parents who did not have great experiences in school. Right. So in order to reach that kid, you probably first gonna have to be able to reach that parent. How do you help change that parent's mindset about school? And help them to be a partner and an ally with you instead of it being an us against them mentality. And sometimes you got to admit the wrong that schools have done to parents yeah. and help them understand how you're different and you're not going to do that same wrong to their child. So grace with accountability is the thing I think administrators, leaders are going to have to come with as we move forward. You can't don't be so hard on your deadline. Like you like give some grace, understand where that just like you dealing with stuff as a leader, that teacher's dealing with stuff, that student's dealing with stuff, that parent's dealing with stuff. So grace with accountability is something that's definitely going to have to be in place as school leaders if you want to build a positive school community moving forward. I love it. Grace with accountability. Hey, folks, take that note. Uh, grace with accountability. Those powerful words. You know, um, I think about this a lot, Doc. The um, pandemic and, and, and what it uncovered as it relates to equity. Um, but I also found some silver linings. You're, you're on the front lines. You're in the building. I'm the guy that flies in to give advice, right? But one of the things I found, like, I never, the only time I used Zoom and other virtual platforms was when someone interviewed me 
for a podcast interview, right? Some kind of interview. But then when the pandemic came, we all discovered that those platforms can be used with more than just one on one. They can be used with thousands of people. So I thought to myself, I said, well, in that case, as a school leader, as a teacher, there's more access to parents now than there was prior to the pandemic because we don't need them in the building. We don't need to call, make separate phone calls all the time. There's certain things that we can have li literally have, a, have, have a, a principal's meeting with the parent community. Teacher can have a, 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 a parent's meeting with the entire parent community. There's so much we can do with this. So that was one of the silver linings. My question to you is, have, be, out, outside of that, have you found any silver linings that despite the challenges of a pandemic, here's a plus that we have that we may not have had prior to? I mean, I think you hit the, the nail on the head, you know, the, the, the virtual capability of reaching parents. I'm, I'm a big proponent. I grew up, uh, you know, raised by my grandmother. Uh, my father was a drug addict. My mom was, you know, in prison for part of my life for selling drugs. Uh, so my, my grandmother couldn't make it to the parent teacher conference all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, she couldn't make it to the long term suspension hearing that I had to go to for whatever reason. We don't get into those right now. <laughs> so um, so I think schools shunned parents that couldn't make it there because they didn't have a car, they lived too far, or they had to work a night shift and they couldn't make it to parent-teacher conference. The schools weren't accommodating. And I think the one thing that the virtual platform ha should have done for school leaders is help us become more account accommodating and get rid of that mindset of wanting parents to come to us instead. How do we go to parents? How do we have parent-teacher conference? Even though the pandemic is over, if that parent can't make it there and say, hey, I got to work a night shift. Hey, are you available at 10 o'clock to meet with the team? We can do it via Zoom, Google Meet, or whatever it may be. The one thing that I do that I, I continue to do is my virtual conversations with Dr. Smith. So I, I would do a, a virtual town hall meeting with my parents mm. about you know whatever we're dealing with. And that started because of the pandemic, because we couldn't have back to school nights like we wanted to. But yeah. parents still had questions. You know, I'll do a Facebook Live, you know, in our parent Facebook group to kind of talk to parents about whatever we're dealing with or what's going on. Mm. So that virtual capability. No school should have an excuse they can't reach a parent or can't have something where parents can be accessible because now the school has the capability of going to the parent, to the community, and instead of the school and the community coming to the parent, I mean, for the parent, the school community coming to the school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's I, I, you know, because I'm sitting here, you know, doing virtual presentations, but I'm, I'm starting to process that as a principal. And, and, and to me, the conclusion was, yeah, this thing is a silver lining. We, we have more access now. Because a lot of parents couldn't come out for various different reasons, as you stated. But if I can give you a link and you at least have a cell phone, then we can still reach you that way. Right. And, now, even, it, and, so even if, they, and if they're not available at the time that re record it, you can easily record right. it, send it out, post it, and then send a, you send a uh, Google form with it. If you have any questions, please fill out this Google form. I will try to answer as many questions as possible. Put out a FAQ afterwards. Like. Right. You like you got to get rid of all the excuses on why we can't interact with parents yeah. in the community. Yeah. So you hear that, folks? I mean, we 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 got this. It's just a matter of the culture that you develop that this is going to work for you in terms of having that ongoing dialogue with your community, whether it be your parent community, your broader community, whatever it is. You know, um, uh, Vashon, you 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 have these three. And by the way, folks, hit the share button, hit the retweet button. We good with time? Twelve fourteen, and I'm 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 almost there. So we good. So hit that share button, hit that retweet. Let them know we still here. Dr. Vashon Smith is dropping nuggets. You got you all been saying that in this 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 thread of these four platforms ever since we've been on here. And I appreciate all that. You know, you you have these three priorities at your school. You know, I talked about the three ingredients before, but now you've got these three priorities. And they're the, the three priorities are relationships intentional planning and delivery of instruction as being one and then advancing literacy and numeracy as being another. So relationships, intentional planning and delivery of instruction and advancing literacy and numeracy. Before I get into the specificity of the priorities, I want to ask you, what made you feel that you needed to have certain priorities? Forget about the three for the moment. Just why, why, why do you have priorities as a leader? So um, when I when I got hired uh, as principal of Grammy Middle School, uh, my my boss, the person I directly reported to, Dr. Joanne King, who was the assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction, 
um, she said that you need to sit down and meet with certain constituent groups in your building, you know, uh, and it was a group of people that I met with. Uh, the first one was my, my administrative assistant. That was the first meeting I had at the Cheesecake Factory with Ms. Oliver. Uh, next was with Mr. Moore, my assistant principal, one of my assistant principals at the time. And the third one was with uh, Samantha Dane, who was my instructional coach, who is now a principal at Belvedere, Belvedere Elementary in our school district. Um, so I met with them three and we kind of had some dialogue. And um, based on those conversations, I then met with the math department, the science department, social studies department, ELA department over the summer. And I remember when I told all three of them that I was going to do this, they were like, you ain't going to get teachers to come to the building in the summertime. And that, that was the culture of the building that I was coming into. But I had one thing that I know get everybody to come out, and that's called food. Mm. <laughs> so when I emailed each one of those groups, I said, hey, I need two hours of your time. If you can just give me two hours of your time, I will pay for your lunch. Here's the menu. Pick whatever you want. I don't care what it is. You get as many as you want. If you want to order lunch and dinner that day, I, it's on me. But just give me two hours of your time. And I asked two questions in those meetings. And it was a two-hour conversation each time. The first one was, what has been going right in this building? And what do you need to move this building to the next level? Mm. And the one thing that came bubbled to the top was they felt that there was no clear direction that was consistently in place at the building for the last X number of years. So I was like, okay. So basically they wanted a vision. They wanted direction. And they were saying basically every year they were chasing some new silver shiny thing. So uh, I read a book and I'm trying not to get to my book, but I read this book and when it's in this book, it talked about priorities and having direction and things like that there. So from there, I went back and I looked at the attendance data for the previous you know, few years. I looked at the achievement data and based on those conversations and that me, my instructor coach and assistant principal sat down and I said, here's where I think we need to go. We did a, we did a root cause analysis on a couple of different things. And that's kind of why the priorities came up. And the one thing, I know we're going to get into the, the, the in-depth of each one, but I told my staff the first day when they came back after convocation, my very first meeting with them, these are our three priorities. And as long as I'm principal here, these will be our three priorities. Mm. And anything that you want to do in this building, professional development, conference, curriculum, resource, you need to be able to tell me how they align with one of our three priorities. Hmm. So let's go into them. Relationships was the first one. What is it? So, so as, as, as a building, what does that look like as a priority? Oh, uh, I mean, that, that's the one I think is the most hard to really put into words because it's just a feeling in our building. Okay. I mean, we, we've been doing it now that, you know, when you walk in, you're going to be greeted with a smile. You know, when you interact with anybody in the building, it's going to be at a level of respect and rapport. Uh, when you see teachers interacting with students, even if that student is upset if that teacher has them as themselves escalated another teacher is going to step in and help with that situation so that we don't have kids and teachers yelling at each other mm -hmm. um it, it it's all about how do we present material to kids you know when we talk about the earlier routines procedure expectations how is that presented to kids is that presented just as a sit and get or are we having kids model what that looks like are we showing kids what it looked like but also are we showing kids what it doesn't look like do we have the resources in place that if a kid does need extra support from a social emotional standpoint, do we need to bring in our cornerstones of care partners? Do we need to bring in our rediscover partners? Do we need to have our behavior interventionists come in and help us formulate that conversation? Because maybe we don't have the skills or the tools to have that conversation. Because I think a lot of times we always look at the positive side, but what's happening on that negative side? What are we doing to make sure we don't continue to make the same negative mistake time after time and time after again? So I think that's that relationship piece, um, really looking at how are we rewarding kids? How are we celebrating kids? How are we making sure kids' voices are heard and saw throughout the building from the billboards that are on our wall? You know, mm -hmm. we have students' work displayed all over the building. Um, you know, we if you go look at our Twitter page, we're always taking pictures of our kids doing activities in classrooms and things like that. Okay. We mm -hmm. want to make sure the student is the visual that people are seeing without in the community. And I got that, you know, from a conference I went to when, about social media because we didn't have a social media presence before I got there. But in my first year, I heard somebody say, you can tell your story or somebody else can tell your story. That's right. And I want the positive in our story to be so loud that it drowns out any negative that tries to come up. Wow. And, and you know, that's that's a critical piece. Um, I just want to reinforce it for the audience that that, stu that that school is about those students, how you utilize your space, your walls, but also how you utilize your social media. It matters. 
you know, that that second one, intentional planning and delivery of instruction. Let me put the focus on the intentional planning. What, is, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? So intentional planning is we have planning meetings twice a week uh, on Monday. We have PLC meetings. Um, so that's when they get together and they kind of look at the data. Hey, you know, what do we need to reteach this week? You know, what targets are we trying to hit upon? What strategies are we going to use? Uh, you know, when are we going to assess kids? How are we going to assess kids? And then what data do we need to bring back to next week's meeting to see if we hit those targets for the week? This year, what we have incorporated on Fridays, we have what we call curriculum planning meetings. And that's when the administrator then steps into that PLC and the teachers walk us through what their lessons are going to look like. And there are certain criteria, things that we are looking for as administrator. So talk to me about what are your learning targets each day? Talk to me about what academic vocabulary are you hitting upon each day? Talk to me about when are you going to use academic teaming this week? Talk to me about uh, where is your open ended question where kids have to create a constructive response. You're going to give them value added feedback to this week. So we really get into the details of looking at specifically what are you doing each day and how are you going to hit that target? And then what is your evidence of learning? that you know that kid hit that target at the end of each day. And it can't be just an exit. No, I want to know what can what would that kid be able to do or know when they walk out of your room after that 53 minute period, Monday through Friday. They're planning. You know, folks that know me as a presenter know that I don't do any presentations. It's very rare that I don't talk about some level of planning. You know, even with the leadership, the leadership blueprint. Planning just matters, accompanied with, by goals. And, 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 and I don't know how anybody can do anything optimally when there's no plan attached to it. You know, just just like like there's a I mentioned it last week and I'm going to mention it again. If some of those folks are on this call, forgive me. But I was in a district I won't name. And they said they hadn't done lesson planning in 15 years. And I couldn't move away from it. It had nothing to do with my presentation, but I couldn't move away from it because I was flabbergasted. You hadn't done lesson planning. So therefore, no oversight of lesson planning. Just what are they what are the teachers doing then? just going in and teaching what they feel comfortable with? Right. And it, it just didn't make sense to me. But planning is so critical. So when I looked at your priorities and I saw the, the, the intentional planning, you know, it resonated with me. And that's why I wanted you to expound upon it. And, and then the you, other thing when I, before I got there, they, they didn't even have a lesson plan. They were pl they were doing lesson plans. But like it was kind of however you want to do it. Some people turning it on a Word doc. Some people turn it on a, a Google slideshow. Some people turning it on Excel. It was all over the place. So that's the one thing that we did. We systemized the process. We gave them a template and it has evolved over the years based on teacher input to the point. Now, this year we have they have one workbook for, say, for example, seventh grade math has a workbook. It's a Google work, uh, Google Sheets workbook. And in that workbook, you have your long range plan. You have your unit plan that you're currently working on. And then you have your lesson plan and PLC document for each week throughout that unit. So it's all concise. So if I want to know what seventh grade is doing, I can go to that one plan and I have all the information that I need to when I walk into that classroom, I should be able to see what's on that lesson plan. That's how I, I tell teachers. Your lesson plan should be to the point where I could put anybody in that room. They should be able to pick it up and go forward with your instruction. Wow. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. And then that last one, it, advanced literacy and numeracy. And, and, and the word that jumped out at me was the word advanced, right? So it wasn't just literacy and numeracy. It's, it's advanced literacy numeracy. What, what, what does that look like as a priority? So the, the reason why I want to advance literacy and numeracy in there is because a lot of times when we talk about raising reading levels and doing that, we always talk about the kids that are behind. We never talk about the kids that are on grade level. How do we continue to push them forward? So in our Bulldog Challenge class, which is a, our, inner, uh, our class that every kid has, um, it's our intervention and enrichment hour. So those kids who need those interventions, need those gap failure, we're going to give you that. But our kids on grade level, we want to enrich the learning for you. We want to continue to push you here. So my seventh graders that are reading on an eighth, ninth grade level, we want to make sure we're giving you text on an eighth, ninth grade level, along with questions that's going to push your thinking forward. So advancing literacy numbers means that I don't care where you come to me at. When you walk out of here, you're going to be at a more advanced level than where you started at. Wow. Wow. Good stuff. You know, we're wrapping it up, folks. Hit that share button one more time. Hit that retweet. Let them know the knowledge is still coming. I got I got two more. Um, your bio indicates that you have a particular focus on creating a school where schools enroll families, not just students. What does that mean? Schools unroll families. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. And you're going to help me with this because I can't remember my man's name uh, that was on your show a few weeks ago. Um, but he, he, he coined that term for me. Basically, he was talking about he's all about enrolling families. And I, I meant to look it up before I came on the show. Uh, he had the black hat on, black shirt. I think he's, uh, is he, 
Oh, yeah, the, black, I, the cowboy hat? No, no. Uh, I think he might be Irish or something like that. Uh, skateboard, oh, oh. the skateboarder principal. Oh, oh, no, that's that's um, that's 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 Hamish Brewer. Hamish. So he, yeah, I, he I saw, one. Yeah, yeah, I stole that from him. So we were doing it, but I just didn't know how, he put it into words for me. He was able to help me articulate. So the one thing that we do is we really focus on family, right? I mean, I'm a middle school, and everybody knows pretty much the family at the middle school level. Parents back off. They want to try to get their kids. And I'm like, this, I don't need you to back up. This time when I need you to come in. I need you to lean in more. Um, so my second year, mind you, it was the COVID year. My second year, my own wow. personal wow. growth plan. On my growth plan, the thing that I was being evaluated for that year was, was to increase parent and community engagement. Because I knew the importance of having parents and community in a pandemic year more, more, more nonetheless to bring them on board and get them on point. To the point, I took, you know, we talked about earlier how we was recognized for our work with the PTA at our school. At a middle school level, I had 125 members in my PTA last year mm. in a middle school. Wow. More than just about every elementary probably across the yeah, state. I hear that. So yeah. we really want to make sure whatever a family needs, I mean, we're, we're doing things. We do our back to school night. We do, uh, we do our uh, back to school barbecue at the beginning of the school year to help parents make sure they're enrolled. We have all our community partners come in. We you know feed them. We do a, a big old barbecue. We have a raffle giveaways uh, at Thanksgiving. Me and my fraternity brothers, uh, as I you know, I'm a proud member of Phi Beta for Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, we give out a hundred Thanksgiving baskets to my families. Um, so we want to make sure how can we support the community and our families, whatever it is that a parent needs. I, I look at it as that old, you know, back back before my time, it probably was before your time too. When you when the phone first came out, you had to make a phone call. You called the operator, and the operator would connect you to who you need to talk to. That's what the school should be for families. Whatever that family needs, we should be that connecting partner to whatever they need. So, and our district has really taken that on. Like I said, we have a partnership with Cornerstones of Care and Rediscover, which are some of our um, local help with therapy and family navigation and things like that. There, so I have a family navigator and a therapist in my building five days a week, as long as students are in the building. So really making sure that we are connecting families, whatever you may need, if you need a job, hey, can I connect you with a job searching agency? You need to help writing your GED. Can I put you, or get in the GED, can I connect you with that? What can we do to help the family? Because if, like I said, if that parent, if that family knows you're in it for them, they know you're in it for their student too. Yes, sir, yes, sir. You know, that operator you spoke about that connected those calls, that, that was my mother and she's she's on here watching she watches all of these so my mother actually worked that job many years ago <laughs> connecting when you make the phone call right so um i got one more for you um school is beginning for some soon others it started already what encouraging words of advice do you have particularly for an ap to have a solid year this year uh, so for an AP, I'm going to speak specifically to the AP. Let me go back to my AP day. And I love being an AP, like love, love, love being an AP. It was a, a great five years. Um, is don't forget your why. Because the why is front and center on the day one. It might even be front and center on week two. But November's coming and February's coming and March is coming. And the bad times are going to happen because we are imperfect people le leading imperfect people. So keep your why at the forefront. Like I said, if that's a reminder on your desk, if that's a scripture or an affirmation on your mirror in the morning, yeah. keep your why at the forefront because in those dark times, that why is going to mean everything. That's you, right. And then remember that that why that I mean I, that, I can't stress that why. I'm so your why is so important to me. If you came to my building outside, most of my teachers' classroom because my new teachers ain't got it yet because we ain't did the PD for them yet is their why statement. And it's why they do the work they do. Because every time they walk through that door, going into that classroom, I want them to remember why they're doing what they do. Like, so that would be my encouragement work. Keep that why at your forefront, no matter your situation. And no, change don't happen overnight. That's right. If you're not where, what you're doing, what you want to do as an AP right now, systematically, strategically, start to put those nuggets in place. And, and you might not see, as the great Dr. Martin Luther King said, he may not make it to the mountaintop with you. But that person behind you, that's coming behind you, is going to appreciate the work you're putting in today. There you go. There you go. Love it. Love it, man. Let's let's go to them BAM impact questions. 21 questions, one word, one sentence only. Here we go. Rapid fire. Is education on the right path for underserved children? Hell no. 
<laughs> Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown, and other underserved students? Once we dismantle it, yes. Can Dr. Vashon Smith's work contribute to the progress we desperately need? Without question. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? It would be a carbon copy. Why do you continue to do this work? Because I believe representation matter and black and brown kids need to see more people like me. What fires you up within the work that you do? My student faces. What do you love about the work you do? My student faces. What do you dislike about the work that you do? Adults without a growth mindset. Mm. What has been your greatest victory in this work thus far? Being principal at Grandview Middle School. What was your greatest mistake in your leadership? Not building the proper relationship with my assistant principals my first year. What has been your greatest challenge within your leadership? Adults without a growth mindset. Are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you proud of your first year as a principal? Oh, for sure, without a doubt. Who inspires you in this work? Wow, who inspires me in this work? So it shows show, but you know, that's, that goes without question, so I'll have to say you, but uh, <laughs> um, one, one of my amazing mentors, uh, Beth Huff, who is the national Oh yeah, middle school principal of the year. You know she was on here. Oh yes, I do. Oh yeah, that, oh, yeah. that, that yeah. Me, me and Beth. That, that's that's my girl. That's my. Oh. Girl. I'm lucky enough to call her friend. Lucky enough. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, she's big time. Um, what are you reading right now? Uh, I am reading. So during the school year, I try to read the books that my students are reading. Uh, we're uh -huh. big on literacy. So right now, I'm reading the book uh, "The Stars Beneath Our Feet" about a young man in New York who lost his brother. Hmm. What book would you recommend to our viewers? So you, I'm, I'm gonna have to, you know, break your rule on the one word there. So the book I would recommend first, I'm gonna do this two parts. The two parts, sorry, is "Lead Like a Pirate" by Shelley Burns and Beth Huff. That is my Bible. I think every administrator should have it on their desk. That's all I'm gonna say about that. But the other book you need to get is the Assistant Principal 50, and I'm all about sowing the seeds into other people. So I have five copies of this book. Oh man! All you gotta do is hit me up on Twitter, and I'm dropping it in the mail to you. I got five copies. Hit me up on Twitter with your address. Now you gotta do it the right way. Hit me up in my inbox, not on my on my. Uh, just don't tweet me. You gotta hit me in the inbox. Five copies, the first five people I'm dropping in the mail for you on Monday. Wow, I'm, I'm honored by that deeply. Wow. Um, what do you want to What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? Um, ninety percent of my kids walking out of eighth grade reading on grade level. Are you satisfied with where you are now professionally? I am. What could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Uh, get in a circle where you can find a sponsor that's already in that room that can open the door for you. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? You gotta go back and find that why. You got into this work for a reason. You got into this work for a reason. Despite whatever it is that has put that fire out, trust me, those ambers are still burning. Go ahead and flame that flame with your why. Love it. And finally, if Dr. Vashon Smith was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Mediocrity's worst nightmare. Whoa. That's a little different. Mediocrity's worst nightmare. I love that, man. Let me tell you something. You, you slam this thing out of the park, man. You get my back, man. Hey, y'all, if, if if you like what you heard, you know what to do. Give me, give me, give me some emojis. Give me some flames. Give me some hearts. Give me some praise. Give me whatever. Let, let them know that you appreciate the time spent this morning, but you hit it out the park, man. You, you now, now with you having that St. Louis background, you you a, you a Cardinals fan at all? Oh, you know, we we rep the Royals in Kansas City now. Come on. Yeah, well, you were, yeah, you there now. You try to start a war. You know, try to start a war, man. <laughs> start a war. But you hit it out of here, man. Bam. Four runs. Four four runs. Grand slam. I see all that fire and these bombs and hearts, black hearts. Everything's coming now. 
Yeah, they love you. Hey, hey, let them know how they can, you know, stay in contact with you. I, I hope you write that book very soon so I can say let them know how they can get that book. Let them know how they can get that blog post, too. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the blog, all my blog posts are on the uh, Principles Project on Twitter. So just hit up them, the Principles Project on Twitter. I do a lot of work with them. Uh, so as far as hitting me up, uh, LinkedIn, Dr. Vashon Smith, Vashon Smith on Facebook, Dr. V as in Victor Smith, Dr. V Smith on Twitter. And then I'm co-host of the Engage podcast with the amazing Unc Ray Akram uh, out in New York and uh, Demetrius Ball, who's out in California. Make sure you check out our next show this upcoming Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We are actually doing a show for parents, especially at 101 and really educating parents around special education. Uh, and then you can hit us up on the Engage Podcast, Facebook, the Engage Podcast, and also on Twitter, the Engage underscore podcast. Uh, like I said, appreciate the time, sir. I can't thank you enough. Oh, I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to have that flyer up on when I do my Sunday posting. I'll have it up uh, tomorrow morning, everybody, so that you can tune in. If I'm not on the road or in an airplane, I'll be on there as well. But um, look out for that. And, you know, stay connected. You got a, got got another resource on here now. Let me um, let me close this out. Vashon, just stay there for me. Hey, folks, appreciate you being here as always. Let a friend, let a colleague know that we do this every Saturday. I'll be up next Saturday, first Saturday in September. So as far as I'm concerned, the summer is over. I know it's not officially over, but when it's September, in my mind, it is over. My man, John W. Cook the third. you know what I mean, because you're in Jersey, so you're getting ready to go back to school now. Summer is over. Vincent Stallings, I see you out there. Summer is over. Belize is over. <laughs> it's time to check back in, right? So I'll be here next Saturday, solo Saturday, first Saturday of every month. This is, I'm, I run, I fly solo, but I got a cameo appearance. My man, Dwight Carter's new book, Be Great. I told him I need you to stop by and talk a little bit about that. So he'll be in in the first few minutes, and then I'm going solo. I got a lot to say to launch the new school year. Make sure that every Saturday morning at 10, at 10 o'clock, Facebook Live, Sean Hurt, followed by Create and Educate at 1030, Dr. Sheikha Houston and Tammy Taylor, followed by Sunday night. That's at 1030. Followed by Sunday night at 7, my man, Principal Josh Tovar and Dean Packard. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, we got the Village Leadership Group with Dr. Roz Gaskins and Coach Williams. And then we said, give me that date again um, of Vashon Wednesday, right, for um, Engage Podcast? Yeah, Wednesday. Yep. And then real quick, somebody said how they get me on Instagram. I forgot about that. You can hit me up on Instagram, uh, SS3KingsAce. That's my, uh, you know, my signal platform, SS3KingsAce. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm not even going to put my books on the screen um Vashon took care of that so those of you that first five you get a free copy of the assistant principal 50 make sure you visit principalcafele.com for all my resources man it's not just a marketing site it's a i call it a an institute of professional learning so i got a lot on there videos blogs articles and stuff in fact i got a bunch of articles i wrote that i haven't even put on there particularly from learning forward those of you that don't know i'm a columnist this year every other month i have a new article out with learning forward, but I haven't put the links on my webpage yet. So I'll do that. Uh, subscribe to the virtual AP leadership Academy, YouTube channel. So you can watch all of these and get all the updates like, and follow the virtual AP leadership Academy, Facebook page. I think a lot of y'all sleeping on that still. We, we got 7,000 um, uh, likes and, and 8,000 some odd followers, but I still want to make sure that folks know that I write that commentary every Sunday morning before 10. That's the, the second part of the academy first parts the virtual on saturday morning and then the second part is the commentary follow-up so make sure you get your hands on that but you can only see that through the virtual ap leadership academy facebook page and then lastly your diet make sure you're taking care of that your exercise make sure you're taking care of that i was on the treadmill thursday night at midnight it was 12 30 a.m and i was still on it because you know i had a heart attack man so it's, it's not negotiable for me i have to do it so i was tired but i said let me get this 35 minutes in and then i'll go to sleep so make sure you're taking care of yourself covid precautions monkey pox virus precautions right and whatever other virus is going to come out here and impact us all just take precautions other than that y'all i see you next saturday 1055. If you're starting school this week for the first time, have an extraordinary year. 
if you're continuing from enough from a previous start date, then keep on rocking. Keep on doing what you do and then make a stop at 1055 next Saturday and let's get together and recharge. So with that said, have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Cock that fist back. One, two, three. Bam! I'll see you next Saturday. Have an extraordinary week.